Hi there, Steve Kaufman. <clears throat> Today I'm going to try to be a little controversial. Uh, I am sure that I will generate a lot more thumbs down than I have in the past. I'm going to talk about linguistics and language learning. And the reason is that I discovered uh, through the internet a person called Amore Gaithin. I'm not sure how uh, his name is pronounced, but it's someone who taught English as a foreign language for 35 years in Britain. Uh, I have put on my blog a link to an article he wrote about rational language teaching, and I'm also going to put a link at my blog to an article he wrote called Anti-Linguistics or something to that effect. Uh, it's also a book that he published, and he is a very clear thinker and who debunks a lot of the um, unnecessary complication that surrounds the field of linguistics and language teaching. How relevant do I feel linguistics is to language learning? Answer, not very, not very. All these terms like morphology and phonemes and syntax don't add much to our knowledge of language learning. Uh, all of the considerable research that's been done in various linguistics departments on and particularly insofar as applied linguistics is concerned into language learning hasn't done much to improve the quality of language instruction. Uh, there are fads, as Gaithin uh, points out, uh, different fads in language instruction, different fads in linguistics, and the fallacy, as he points out, is this attempt to come up with codes or systems or theories to describe what is in fact much simpler and more natural, and that is how we use language. Uh, you know, a primary example of this unnecessary complication is the famous Chomsky theory of universal grammar, which is one of the mainstays, one of the sort of canons of linguistics. Uh, some people see him as akin to Darwin uh, in terms of his discovery, uh, according to him, a discovery that we have some innate uh, sort of capability to learn languages, that our ability to learn languages is not just based on the way the brain learns other things. In other words, how the brain develops patterns, uh, to deal with all of the experiences that it encounters in life. His position is that based on his theory of uh, uh, limited stimulus or paucity of stimulus, P-A-U-C-I-T-Y, I think it is, that there isn't enough stimulus simply from our exposure as children to the language to explain the fact that within a few years, a child is able to speak grammatically correctly. His position is that there must be some innate ability to uh, sort of understand or identify what is correct grammar and what is not correct grammar. And since grammars vary from language to language, there must be a universal grammar, sort of the essence of grammar, that is uh, hardwired in our brains and that that is then the secret of why we are able to understand what is correct and not correct. I just, I'm not, a, I have never studied linguistics. I've read up on it. I, I just can't see how this makes sense. I've studied 14 languages. Every language is different. The grammar is different. Um, and what is difficult in learning a language, to my mind, would not be this sort of essence of grammar but all the ways in which different languages are different. All of the exceptions, all of the um, you know, idiomatic patterns, the vocabulary, that's a huge part of learning a language. And there's no way that a child is born with some innate universal vocabulary for all the different languages. And, and, uh, but even in terms of grammar, like I don't know, in Russian, you say, uh, you, you, they talk, for example, when you read Pinker and Chomsky, they talk about, uh, you know, if a language has this, then it has that. Or 
we know uh, instinctively that certain word, word order is not correct, but word order varies all over the place. And again, in the case of Russian, you can actually vary it. You can say, to say, um, you know, uh, you have a book, you say book, you ha book to you is book, uh, book is to you. You can move it around in different ways that would not make sense in English. And all of the examples that I see in, in the examples that Pinker and Chomsky use seem to relate to English. At any rate, uh, Gaithen points out that some of these, if the language has X, therefore Y, are quite incorrect, that Finnish doesn't conform to it. Uh, it, it. Pinker had some examples of how you flip the order for questions. Well, in Japanese, you say, you know, Hondes, Hondeska, that's a question. You don't flip anything. Uh, for that matter, uh, you know, in Japanese, uh, you know, if, in, in Russian, if you say, uh, I have a book. Uh, in Japanese, you say, uh, book is, or book are. It doesn't even specify whether it's is or are. I mean, there are so many varieties. And, and when you read a Russian grammar book, the complexity, like, uh, you know, one of something, one year, that's the nominative singular, that's the genitive singular of the word for year. But then five or more is uh, which is the genitive plural of the word for summer. Okay. Now, I'm sure the Chomsky uh, supporters will say that those variations don't really matter. But it's the variations that are difficult, the variations that are so tremendously complex. Any supposed um, universal essence of grammar would be child's play compared to the complexity of learning all of these other exceptions and vocabulary and idioms and so forth and so on. And if a child can learn all those other things in the first few years of his or her life just by listening and, and reacting to uh, uh, what uh, the child hears, uh, getting it wrong a few times and then eventually getting it right, that to me is the bigger job. And, and I think that job is not so very different from what we do as adults when we learn except that as adults, we have some psycho psychological hang-ups uh, because we're afraid to make mistakes, and we also have the advantage of having more, more vocabulary. So, uh, but even in general, uh, you know, linguistics, uh, yeah, on the other hand, yeah, uh, what was I going to say? You know, you go to the internet, and w w the problem with linguistics to me is, in many cases, people who teach languages have been studying linguistics. So they're all wrapped up in these theories. Uh, and um, so if I Google, for example, ESL and critical thinking, I find like millions of pages because I know this from experience. Having been on this uh, ESL teachers uh, forum on the Internet, they love to get into critical thinking uh, because they somehow feel that they can teach someone who's not a native speaker of English critical thinking. Not to me obvious at all that they're better at critical thinking. It is also not obvious to me that critical thinking is related to language learning. Uh, as my one of my favorite educators, Ruben Malvez, whom I listened to a lot when I was learning Portuguese, says that when we are reading, nothing destroys our interest in reading as much as being asked to analyze what we have read, to answer questions about what we have read. So. Again, I believe that all of this overcomplication is actually, it discourages language learning. Uh, all of the terminology about morphemes and phonemes and syntax and so forth discourages language learning. Uh, all of the fads uh, in the classrooms, role playing, getting uh, students uh, who speak the language imperfectly to speak to each other uh, is not effective, as Gaithen again points out. Far better that they listen to the language as spoken by a native speaker. And so ultimately, and, and I should point out as well that, uh, uh, as Gaithen points out, you know, what happens in linguistics, uh, I think uh, humans like a theory, a system. Uh, uh, and so then you get the sort of high priests of these system. Uh, you know, Marx's, uh, uh, you know, uh, theory of history, which is complete bunk, but uh, and of course, it didn't turn out to be correct. His, his uh, whatever his theory was called, historical materialism or whatever it was, uh, stages of, of different societies and so forth. And yet, there are people who firmly believe, who who analyze all the uh, 
events of history and so forth uh, through the prism of this uh, Marxist approach to history. It's like the, the thought that the sun revolves around the earth and we had the high priests of that. Uh, and uh, yeah, so linguistics is one of those. Relatively uninteresting to most people, relatively impractical, but it has that same appeal that Marxism or any other theory has, dogma, it's sort of intellectually challenging. And so people create theories and counter theories and so forth. Unlike Darwin, uh, the uh, universal grammar theory uh, is not based on observation. It's based on making an assumption that languages are too complicated to learn based on the limited exposure that the children get. Therefore, there must be a universal grammar, but it's not based on anything that is provable or observable. So, and why is this important? Because I think the essence of language learning is its simplicity. In other words, we need, we don't have any universal grammar in our heads. As second language learners, we're very much influenced by our first language, which limits, you know, we expect the sounds, the structures and so forth to conform to what we learn for our first language, which is kind of hardwired in our brain. And we need to expose our brains to as much as possible of the second language so that the brain has a chance to develop uh, another set of patterns to deal with the second language. And the more open-minded we are, the more we want to, again, attitude, the more we like it. So because the, our ability to learn is influenced by emotion. This is another thing that Gaithin points, points out that all of these studies of whether language system, learning system A is better than language learning system B, hasn't the ability to evaluate the emotional commitment of the learner. And therefore, a lot of the results are not that useful. Uh, however, however, uh, you know, I'll take an example of the, uh, there was a study by the American uh, Center for Applied Linguistics on the effectiveness of classroom, classroom instructional hours on ESL learning, English learning by immigrants. And they showed that it, you know, it improved depending on the number of hours. But in fact, in some cases it went down. The more instructional hours, the poorer the results. Uh, and why is that? Because maybe the instructional hours are quite irrelevant. What matters more is the emotional commitment of the learners, the extent to which they do things outside the classroom. Do they read on their own? Do they listen on their own? Are they working, are they working in an English speaking environment? These are much more important than the instructional hours. Yet most studies on language learning deal with what happens in the classroom. It's possible that the classroom is the least important factor in terms of language learning uh, success. Uh, again, we had this example in Canada of, of several thousand Chinese immigrants who were measured after seven years and who had essentially made no progress in their language learning despite attending language class. So to me, as I often say, you know, obviously it's attitude number one, time with the language, and then developing this ability to notice, and massive input, read, listen, then eventually speak, write. These are simple. You don't need to know terms like morpheme, phoneme, syntax, or anything else. You don't need to know about linguistics. All you need to do is to be motivated to learn the language and ingest read, listen as much of it as you can, and then start speaking about uh, using the language and don't worry about how you sound and don't worry about all this other stuff. So uh, I'm sure that will generate a lot of thumbs down. I'm looking forward to your comments. Bye for now.